Hello, everybody. Welcome to ULT San Diego here for the Aquarian series. Today's presentation is The Great Sifter. And this will be given to us by our own Dr. Barbara Hebert. Thank you so much, Monica. It is a joy and a pleasure to be with all of you again, um, brothers and sisters in this incredible study um, together. When Jonathan and I first talked, or when we talked about the topic, the great sifter, he shared two quotes with me. Make sure this is, let's see, that's what I need to do. There. One of those quotes was, of course, it's what Monica read at the very beginning. When a person carefully sifts and consciously discriminates, he or she works with nature without awaiting karma's disciplinary measures. And he also shared this quote, great sifter is the name of the heart doctrine, O disciple from the voice of the silence. The remainder of the quote from the voice of the silence reads, the wheel of the good law moves swiftly on. It grinds day and night. The worthless husks it drives from out the golden grain, the refuse from the flower. The hand of karma guides the wheel. The revolutions mark the beatings of the karmic heart. These quotes encompass a depth and breadth of theosophical concepts. My thoughts began to swirl. What could come from this? Evolution, working with the eternal laws of the absolute, karma, dharma, reincarnation, the ethics of living in the manifested world, the open and secret paths available to us as seekers, and on and on and on, mind-boggling. I already perceive all of you as amazing and deep students of the ageless wisdom. And so putting all of that together, I think my Kama Manas was just in an uproar. So, I did what many of us do when we feel that happening. I sat quietly and pondered these quotes, pondered the teachings to determine how we could explore without wandering aimlessly in the eternal. So I thought, and I thought some more. What do these concepts have in common? When we look at, at each of them and drill down as deeply as we possibly can at this point in our evolution, we find that almost every one of them leads us to the core of the ageless wisdom teachings. They lead us to what may be called the heart of theosophy that provides the underpinning for understanding, again, to the best of our ability, spiritual evolution, the laws of the absolute, and so on. So, what is the heart of theosophy? The core of the ageless wisdom teachings from the perspective of many, the core of the ageless wisdom teachings is love. Now, many people tend to use the word love very casually. Actually, probably all of us do. We use it to indicate things that we like. I love this beautiful flower. I love being here with all of you. I love French fries. <clears throat> Excuse me. At other times, we use the word love in a more personal way. I love my children and I love my grandchildren who are here and I'll keep loving them as long as they're quiet. 
Interesting, isn't it? I don't love French fries the same way that I love my children. They're very different feelings, but the terminology is the same. Not that there's anything wrong with casual or personal use of the word love. Probably makes us happy to think about the vibrations of love rippling out across the world. But these casual uses of the word love, even for love of family, are not what we are talking about here. This is not the love that is at the core of life, at the heart of theosophy. The love that exists as the heart of theosophy is so much deeper and broader. De Peruker, in his book, Golden Precepts of Esotericism, writes, Love is the cement of the universe. It holds all things in place and in eternal keeping. Its very nature is celestial peace. Its very characteristic is cosmic harmony, permeating all things, boundless, deathless, infinite, eternal. It is everywhere and is the very heart of the heart of all that is. That De Peruker's statement sounds as if this type of love is a synonym for the ultimate reality, permeating all things, everywhere, and is the heart of the heart of all that is. This love has no personal implications. It is a universal and impersonal type of love. It is a love that goes beyond anything we can imagine, except possibly in those few moments of meditation or intuitive leaps toward the divine. What we are talking about is love beyond all measure for humanity. Here, we are talking about a specific type of love, agape love, as the Greeks used the word. Agape love can be defined as the highest form of love, a love that incorporates empathy, compassion, understanding, unconditional love, the love of the infinite for humanity and the love of humanity for the infinite. Agape is total love. It is the love that consumes the person who experiences it. Whoever knows and experiences agape learns that nothing else in the world is important. Martin Luther King includes agape as one of the essential elements in his philosophy of nonviolence, writing, agape means understanding, redeeming goodwill for all men and women. It is an overflowing love, which is purely spontaneous, unmotivated, groundless, and creative. It is not set in motion by any quality or function of its object. Agape is disinterested love. It is a love in which the individual seeks not his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Agape does not begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy people or any qualities people possess. It begins by loving others for their sakes. It is an entirely neighbor regarding concern for others, which discovers the neighbor in every man it meets. Therefore, agape makes no distinctions between friends and enemy. It is directed toward both. If one loves an individual merely on account of his friendliness, he loves him for the sake of the benefits to be gained from the friendship rather than for the friend's own sake. 
Consequently, the best way to assure oneself that love is disinterested is to have love for the enemy neighbor from whom you can expect no good in return, but only hostility and persecution. These two quotes point us back to what theosophists have known since HPB began writing and about which many of us have an innate understanding. This love, agape love, is at the center of the ageless wisdom. D. Peruker, while not using the term agape, describes it for us saying, the more impersonal love is, the higher it is, and the more powerful. Impartial love is love that has no attachment. Once we have attachment, love of family, for instance, while it is a form of love, it is not universal love. In Sri Ram, former international president of the T.S. Adyar says, the love which deserves that name is impartial, non-possessive, wholly beneficent. In that love alone is to be discovered the force which will ultimately bring man to his freedom. Love is the only force which does not create or add to the complications of karma. He goes on to say, without love, there is no unfoldment because love belongs to the life of the spirit, to the real self. Without love, all search is in vain. Love that belongs to the life of the real self, as Sri Ram calls it, is often referred to as altruism or philanthropy in theosophical writings. Once again, these words are not used in a casual manner. They denote service to humanity. The Mahatma K.H. writes, the true theosophist is the philanthropist who, not for himself, but for the world, he lives. In Key to Theosophy, HBB tells us, every true theosophist is morally bound to sacrifice the personal to the impersonal, his own present good to the future benefit of other people. She defined true occultism as altruism, and she further tells us a true theosophist must put in practice the loftiest moral ideal, must strive to realize his unity with the whole of humanity and work ceaselessly for others. Dorothy Bell, an Australian theosophist, tells us that as a principle, Altruism expresses the true root meaning of the word theos and Brahma, the motion of expansion from within outwardly, which is also associated with the outbreathing of the great breath. It means giving unconditionally to the whole from within outwardly. It realizes the wholeness and unity of all and every mo movement of that realization of wholeness is open and generous and all embracing. It is compassion, love, gentleness, kindness, and the full expression of who we truly are. So if we act altruistically, we put the needs of the whole before the needs of the self. When we recognize the essential unity of all life, we realize that what happens to one person happens to all of us. We are the wrongly imprisoned. We are the hungry and thirsty. We are the abused and neglected. We are those 
living in war-torn places across the world. We are the other. As theosophists, we have choices to make, don't we? This is clearly stated in HPB's The Voice of the Silence. In fragment two, she describes two paths, the open path and the secret path. We are told that we will have to choose between these two paths. The book says that the open path is, quote, the way to selfish bliss, shunned by the bodhisattvas of the secret heart, the Buddhas of compassion. We're also told that taking the secret path is to forego eternal bliss for self, to help on man's salvation, to reach nirvana's bliss, but to renounce it is the supreme, the final step, the highest on renunciation's path. We're told, the path is one, disciple, yet in the end, twofold. At one end, bliss immediate, and at the other, bliss deferred. Both are of merit. Sorry, both are of merit the reward. The choice is thine. The one becomes the two, the open and the secret. The first one leadeth to the goal, the second to self-immolation. Thus, the first path is liberation, but path the second is renunciation and therefore called the path of woe. Joy Mills, in her book, From Inner to Outer Transformation, says, As is evident throughout the voice of the silence, and indeed throughout all of HPB's writings, the Dharma, or way inherent in the theosophical worldview, is that of the Bodhisattva, the path of renunciation. Ours is the secret path. As theosophists, we live to serve humanity. We follow the Bodhisattva path. We know this, don't we? At some point in our individual journeys, we realized that we were committed to following in the path of the Mahatmas, the teachers of Blavatsky. We made a conscious decision to become true occultists, philanthropic, altruistic, theosophists, whose goal is to work for those great ones in service to humanity. This path, according to HBB, is one that, although the Mahatmas have attained the right to enter in nirvana, they renounce it in order to stay in touch with humanity. The hitherto very esoteric doctrine of the Nirmanakayas was lately brought forward as a proof and explained in the treatise called The Voice of the Silence. These Nirmanakayas are the bodhisattvas or late adepts who having reached nirvana and liberation from rebirth, renounce it voluntarily in order to remain invisibly amidst the world to help poor ignorant humanity within the lines permitted by karma. We, all of us, have chosen to focus to the best of our ability on alleviating the suffering of humanity. One who follows the bodhisattva path is an individual whose thoughts, words, and actions focus on serving the well-being of all others, not merely in a physical sense, but in the highest sense of facilitating enlightenment. The voice of the silence asks, compassion speaks and saith, can there be bliss when all that lives must suffer? Shall thou be saved and hear the whole world cry? We have taken this verse to heart 
and responded that we will serve until all are liberated from rebirth. As it says in the voice of the silence, let thy soul lend its ear to every cry of pain, like as the lotus bears its heart to drink the morning sun. Let not the fierce sun dry one tear of pain before thyself hast wiped it from the sufferer's eye. But let each burning tear drop on thy heart and there remain, nor ever brush it off until the pain that caused it is removed. This is the Bodhisattva way. The voice of the silence continues. These tears, O thou of heart most merciful, these are the streams that irrigate the fields of charity immortal. Tis on such soil that grows the midnight blossom of Buddha, more difficult to find, more rare to view than the flower of the Vogue tree. It is the seed of freedom from rebirth. It isolates the Arhat both from strife and lust it leads him through the fields of being into peace and bliss, known only in the land of silence and non-being. Compassion, says the voice of the silence, is the law of laws, etern eternal harmony. We are enjoined to become compassion absolute. As theosophists, we have chosen this path, self-chosen this path for the sake of humanity. And we will remain with humanity until all pain is removed, until all suffering is gone until the world cries no more. Compassion is, at least from one perspective, the outward manifestation of the love described by Deep Peruker as the very heart of the heart of all that is, and by Sri Ram as the only force which does not create or add to the complications of karma. The Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines compassion as a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress, together with a desire to alleviate it. Going even further, we can look at the etymology of the word compassion, calm, meaning with, and passion, meaning suffering or enduring, from Christ's suffering on the cross. Therefore, the etymology of the word compassion means suffering with, enduring with. So moving forward on the path of compassion requires a great deal of us. It requires that we spiritually transform ourselves through unrelenting self-awareness and objective self-observation. Many theosophical writers have discussed spiritual self-transformation, sometimes called self-regeneration, indicating a need to recreate ourselves in order to serve humanity. Through self-awareness and self-observation, we become aware of those aspects of our personalities that need to be changed or transformed, and then we work to change them. One may ask, why? Why is it incumbent upon us to change in order to serve humanity? Well, Joy Mills tells us, have a sip of water really quickly. Joy Mills tells us, 
The pathway to such transformation lies in the willing of each willingness of each one of us to plunge into the mysterious depths of our own human identity. This process, as we shall see, has been well defined in every tradition and mythology. It is the age old hero or heroine quest of the encounter with the dragons of the psychic realm. The shadows and complexes about which contemporary psychology has so much to say. As it was for Dante, it may well involve our descent into hell, facing all the karma of our own past before an ascent can be made. It is the mystic quest of the medieval alchemist in which the pure gold of the spirit must be distilled from the crude material of the personality. She also tells us that in this effort, we are dealing directly with the psychomental transformations which constitute the hero journey of the soul. She continues and quotes HPB saying, for HPB who clearly restated for our time, the principles of the mystery tradition, stated explicitly that the next developmental stage in our evolution would have, quote, more to do with psychology than with physics. To repeat, the focus of our work today is at the psychological level. It involves dealing with the common monastic field of operation within us. As said so often by HPB and her successors, as well as her teachers, it is a change of consciousness that is required today. And it is this message that is being repeated by many of the leading thinkers of our time. As we change ourselves, because we are part of the one, then all contained within that one must change. As our consciousness expands, then we are facilitating the expansion of consciousness of all beings, even though it's a very, very slow process. We can look to the words of others for additional understanding. Former international president of the T.S. Adyar in Sri Ram writes, the masters of the wisdom who aid evolution, although, although they are interested in all changes that make for human progress, are especially concerned with the spiritual regeneration of mankind, which is of fundamental importance. Because when that takes place, all else follows. What the masters want is this regeneration beginning with ourselves. Krishnamurti tells us, to transform the world, we must begin with ourselves. And what is important in beginning with ourselves is the intention. The intention must be to understand ourselves and not to leave it to others to transform themselves or to bring about a modified change through revolu revolution, either to the left or of the right. It is important to understand that this responsibility is yours and mine. Self-transformation is the work of lifetimes a process that incorporates all aspects of our temporal selves, physical, emotional, and mental. There are very few things more difficult than working on ourselves. It requires not only unrelenting self-awareness, but also objective, oh, self-awareness and self-observation. Working to step away from ourselves and look at ourselves without judgment is perhaps one of the most difficult things we can do 
because we must look at those parts of ourselves that we hide, even from ourselves. This path we have chosen is not an easy one. It will require us to control, to master our personalities, but we have chosen it for the sake of serving humanity. This of course is where karma and sifting comes into our discussion more overtly. When something is sifted, the finer particles are separated from the more coarse particles so that the useful and valuable parts of the material are retained. As indicated in the voice of the silence quote from the beginning of our discussion, which is listed here, karma guides the wheel and it grinds day and night, doesn't it? Doesn't our karma grind day and night? Allowing the spiritually useful and valuable com components of ourselves to be discovered. Karma facilitates our self-transformation. And as we move through our lifetimes on the path of progressive development, we inevitably face issues, obstacles, difficulties, and so on. Our task on this pilgrimage is to learn as we experience these situations because we are finding our way back to who we truly are. Karma is frequently referred to as the law of cause and effect, the law of action and reaction. According to the theosophical teachings, it is a universal law based on harmony. Sorry, I think I once again hit the wrong thing. There, that's where we are. Um, so let me go on. HPB tells us, karma creates nothing, nor does it design. It is man who plans and creates causes. And karmic law adjusts the effects. Which adjustment is not an act, but universal harmony, tending ever to resume its original position, like a bow, which when bent down, rebounds with equal vigor. It's important to note, though, that we really don't understand karma, I think, very well. I think we've only just lifted the veil a tiny bit. We are reminded that its workings are not mechanistic and are difficult to predict, even by initiates. Um, the Mahatma K.H. tells A.P. Senate about karma. You know nothing of the ins and outs of the work of karma, of the side blows of this terrible law. And he later said, have another look at karma and remember that it ever works in the most unexpected ways. Mabel Collins, in her essay on karma at the end of Light on the Path, tells us that the operations of karma cannot be fully understood until this quote, until the disciple has reached the point at which they no longer affect the disciple. We talk about karma as if we truly understand it, but again, probably not. Um, let's see. HPB talks about karma in this way. The inner being must continually burst through its confining shell or encasement. And such a disruption must also be accompanied by pain, not physical, but mental and intellectual. And this is how it is in the course of our lives. The trouble that comes upon us is always just the one we feel to be the hardest we could that could possibly happen. It is always the one thing we feel we can, cannot possibly bear. If we look at it from a wider point of view, she says, we shall see that we are trying to burst through our shell at its one vulnerable point, that our growth, to be real growth, must progress evenly throughout. 
just as the body of a child grows, not first the head and then a hand, followed perhaps by a leg, but in all directions at once, regularly and imperceptibly. She tells us that humanity's tendency is to cultivate each part separately, neglecting the others in the meantime. Every crushing pain is caused by the expansion of some neglected part, which expansion is rendered more difficult by the effects of the cultivation bestowed elsewhere. Let's see. I think I'm going to skip my story about Joe. Um, let's see. As we deal with our karma, as we deal with the difficulties and obstacles that we face in physical manifestation, it is allowing us to grow. We are sifting, essentially, through our personalities. We are finding those golden grains that are useful and valuable in our spiritual path, in our spiritual evolution. And again, as we evolve spiritually, as our consciousness expands, so does the consciousness, the, sorry, so does the consciousness of humanity also expands. It's microcosmic and macrocosmic evolution moving together. I do need to add in a couple of things here. It's important to look at karma, I think, in the light of compassion. But I think one thing that we don't talk about, about very much in, in uh, theosophical circles is self-compassion. I think that's probably more difficult anyway than being compassionate for someone else. It's important to look at authenticity when we talk about self-compassion. Brene Brown tells us, and she is not a theosophist, she's a psychologist, but she's done a lot of work. And if you've not heard of her, you might want to look for her um, TED Talks. She's, she writes, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. Choosing authenticity means cultivating the courage to be imperfect, to set boundaries, and to allow, allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Exercising the compassion that comes from knowing that we are all made of strength and struggle and nurturing the connection and sense of belonging that can only happen when we believe that we are enough. When we wear a mask pretending to be something that we're not, we're not being very compassionate to ourselves we wear that mask because we feel like we're not enough. We're judging ourselves harshly. It takes a great deal of courage to let go of the mask, to let go of the way we think we are supposed to be. We allow ourselves to be seen without any pretenses. This recognition that we are enough sort of sums up our spiritual journey, doesn't it? Our life in this physical world has often been referred to as a classroom. And if we use this analogy, we can think about every child in the classroom being unique, as we are. Each student in the classroom learns differently and at a different pace. When we look at what happens in the classroom, we know that no one makes 100% on every test or every assignment. There is no perfection. As adults, looking at students in the classroom, do we get upset because someone has failed a test or done poorly? I hope not. Hopefully, we realize the student failed or did poorly because the student has not yet grasped the material and needs additional work in a particular area. Needing additional work in a particular area does not make the student less valuable or important. 
Can we see ourselves like this? As important and as valuable as every other being, even when we make mistakes, when we fail a test or do poorly on an assignment, so to speak. Compassion for others is much easier, but still requires a little bit of exploration. If someone is born into a difficult situation, well, we might think it's their karma, right? We shouldn't do anything to change it or correct it. I mean, we don't have the right to change someone's karma. I mean, they chose it, right? Well, not really. Judge tells us, Karmic causes already set in motion must be allowed to sweep on until exhausted, but this permits no man to refuse to help his fellows and every sentient being. And again, he writes, we should not shrink from the duty to relieve pain and sorrow if we can, for it is both cowardice and conceit to say that we will not help this or that man because it is his karma to suffer. In the face of suffering, it is our good karma to relieve it if in our power. Now, Judge used the word good karma, or words good karma. We are told over and over that there is no such thing as good or bad karma, that karma simply is. It's a universal law. Um, my supposition here is that Judge used the word good in relation to karma in order to help others understand more clearly. Um, it's important to note that helping someone in order to create good karma for ourselves is extraordinarily selfish. <laughs> um, it is the opposite of what theosophy teaches. So if our end goal and helping someone is to accrue something for ourselves, then we're not walking the path of compassion, nor are we acting in accordance with theosophical ethics. Let's see, Mabel Collins warned us about this. She says in her essay on karma, those who desire to form good karma will meet with many confusions. And in the effort to sow rich seed for their own harvesting, may plant a thousand weeds and with them the giant. Desire to sow no seed for your own harvesting. Desire only to sow that seed, the fruit of which shall feed the world. You are a part of the world. In giving it food, you feed yourself. Yet in even this thought, there lurks a great danger which starts forward and faces disciples who have long thought themselves working for good, while in their inmost souls, they have perceived only evil. That is, they have thought themselves intending, to benef intending great benefit to the world, while all the time they have unconsciously embraced the thought of karma and the great benefits they work for or for themselves. They may refuse to allow themselves to think of reward, but in that very refusal is seen the fact that reward is desired. So, do we help or do we not help? What happens when we come into contact with another who is suffering? Either way, we reap the consequences of our choices in other words, we will have our own repercussion as the law of laws seeks to balance the equilibrium and harmony of the universe. Judge writes in his aphorisms on karma that for all other men, karma is in its essential nature, unknown and unknowable. I take this to mean that we cannot and do not know the karma of others makes me wonder if perhaps we are a part of that person's karma appearing in his or her life at that particular moment in order to help and to serve. In other words, it seems likely that it is my karma, my opportunity to serve, 
by walking with another person for a while on their journey. Well, we don't really understand karma as I mentioned. So there are two things to think about. That is the possibility that it is our karma to help in some way. And secondly, what judge says, knowledge of karma does not give us permission to choose not to help another being. We may be reminded of Krishna's statement to Arjuna. I think, oh, there it is. Yes, okay. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, those who see action in inaction and inaction in action are truly wise amongst humans. Although performing all kinds of actions, they are yogis and masters of all their actions. Now, reminding you that I am not a scholar of the Gita, but a seeker, um, an interpretation might be choosing to help, choosing not to help, that is inaction, is still in action. Choosing to help can be done without attachment. And the one who understands the two, the difference between the two is wise. Therefore, assuming we choose to help, we help because we are committed to the bodhisattva path. And we do this by helping the other person from that the basis of that universal love that was discussed earlier in the quote from Sri Ram, which is here. That love that is impartial, non-possessive, and wholly beneficent. That does not add, create, or add to the complications of karma. We are serving the other person as a ray of the highest. So we can't get out of this without talking about Dharma for a quick second, quick minute. Um, Joy Mills defines Dharma as our inevitable destiny, the rightness of our self-becoming nature. She calls it the path of spiritual unfoldment. We live our Dharma when we work to understand our true nature, the magnificence of our higher selves, our essential unity with all life. And when we make choices to bring those elements into fruition, helping others, serving humanity from both a macro and a micro perspective is our Dharma. It is through helping and serving that we spiritually unfold and become aware of our inner and real nature. So I'll tell you, this path, I'm not sure if this is what Jonathan had in mind when we talked, but it has taken us on quite a journey. We began with those the initial quotes um, about the great sifter and the words from the voice of the silence. We talked about the love from a universal perspective. We talked about agape, of course. We talked about, sorry, we talked about the secret path, the path that we have all chosen. From there, we talked about compassion and the importance of spiritual self-transformation. This extremely difficult task that requires the work of lifetimes. It also requires courage and bravery. But with each tiny step in our own self-transformation, we are inevitably transforming the whole of humanity. We talked about karma as the facilitator of our transformation and growth. And we explored a number of topics about karma. We talked about self-compassion and we talked about compassion for others. We talked about karma as a sifting within us 
so that we can find those valuable components that we need for our spiritual self-transformation. And finally, we return to the topic of the path of compassion, the bodhisattva path. So, as it says in the voice of the silence, tis from the bud of the renunciation of the self that springeth the sweet fruit of final liberation. He who becomes Pratyeka Buddha makes his obeisance but to his self. The Bodhisattva has won the battle, who holds the prize within his palm, yet says in his divine compassion, for others' sake this great reward I yield accomplishes the greater renunciation. A savior of the world is he. Thank you. I apologize. Yeah, I think that went on longer than I expected. I'm sorry about no, that. No, it took a took you needed some time to go through all that sifting. <laughs> <laughs> Lots That's of beautiful. Stuff. So brilliant. So how you went took us through what the real essence of love, what love is, and that was the sifting, right? Yes. And then that, and then in that sifting. You know, you disclosed really the heart of theosophy, and it's just the whole thing was a sifting and uh, and a distilling. So, thank you so much for this. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you all. And I loved all your use of all the uh, theosophical uh, teachers and so forth. That you know, HPV and Judge and GDP and yes. and Sri Ram and um, uh, Joy Mills. And yes. uh, our dear friend Joy, I'm sure yes. she'd be on your platform if she was still in physical manifestation. Yeah, where is she when we need her? I know and, uh, she's at the party with her friends. You know, as okay. she as she got old, she was quite elderly, just obviously before she died. And I said, "Is it? You know, how are you doing?" And she said, "Well, every essentially, she said, you know, that everybody she knew and loved." her peers and those she loved were all on the other side. And I said, so you're ready to go to that party, aren't you? And she said, yes, I am. So she's at the party with her friends and loved ones over there. So. Okay. Sounds wonderful. Well, uh, this is your chance to talk to Barbara while you got her here. So, um, oh, Monica, why don't you, you want to just come up and, Thank you so much, Barbara. This was a wonderful presentation, just so beautiful and so full. My heart is full. Um, I have a question, maybe two, I'm not sure. But uh, basically, it's this. How does one avoid what we could call obvious pitfalls? entering into uh, self-transformation. How do we transform ourselves without paying attention to ourselves? How do we get that done? Yeah, I don't think we can transform until we pay attention. Whenever we, from my perspective, if if I want to change something, first of all, I have to be aware that it needs to be changed. That's the first step. And then secondly, I have to be aware of every time I do whatever it is I want to change. If I, you know, don't want to eat chocolate anymore, which by the way, is not going to happen. But <laughs> if I didn't want to eat chocolate anymore, I'd have to be aware, first of all, that I didn't want to. And secondly, every time I forgot and then ate it, I would have to you know, observe myself and say, oh, did it again, because we're mm -hmm. going to do it again and again and again. But if we remind ourselves every single time, eventually, as I go to reach for the chocolate, somewhere inside, I'll hear, don't do it. 
And then the next time when I move toward the pantry to reach before I even reach, I'll hear that, don't do it. That's how we change ourselves. It's a difficult, difficult process. And it does take so much time and tremendous attention to self. Thank but you it's so much. Paying attention to self for the sake of humanity. Does that make uh, sense? I mean, it's focused yes. on the self, but we do it for humanity. That's great. That's a that's a that's a beautiful too. I guess what we would have to do is become habituated in that perception of it. Yes, it is. And maybe that habits. way we don't get lost. Yeah, changing nice. habits. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Miluka, I think you were next. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I really enjoyed, I think that your words and the way you presented it was very wonderful and very healing. Thank you. Because as you know, right now, humanity is going through a lot of turmoil. I mean, it's not just wars, but it's also Mother Nature is fighting for its survival, yes. trying to balance the, the stolen, you know, equilibrium that we do with our bad thoughts and actions and lack of brotherhood and compassion. You mentioned compassion and that's something that, yeah, as Phoebe said, you know, the love is the love of compassion. Yes. And um, we sometimes forget that. And um, I wish that a beautiful presentation like that and many others that the Aquarian series do on a, every Saturday will be to the world, not just among us, but it would be public. Yes. The many religions of, I just see all kinds of religions have a television channel, they have a radio. And I say, what is theosophy? Well, we are behind because HPB, when she started, you know, promoting theosophy, she was public. She was writing articles to the newspaper and all that. But why we are kind of concealing some yes. of this information and it's only like preaching to the choir. I'm sorry to say that. Yes. But I think it's time for us to wake up and do more in our own way, even if it's a small seed. But I, I, like I say, thank you so much. I think this was very much needed. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Desiree? Hi, how are you doing? That was a beautiful, beautiful presentation, beautiful collection of, of uh, theosophical voices. I especially um, appreciate the fact that you brought up self-compassion because it's um, so often we get tied up in um, kind of yelling at ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I oftentimes consider my inner self, my child. And I ask myself, would I be saying this to my child? Exactly. Um, and of course the answer to that is in a lot of cases, no. It's actually um, can lead to a lot of mental illness if we don't start to speak kindly to ourselves and ask ourselves, would I say this if, to my own child? So self-compassion is extremely important, I think. And it's also an extension, I believe, of that in eternal love yes. that is experienced, I'll say on the other side, but we know it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there was another question that I had, though, and it had to do with this um, idea of being disinterested. And I had to wonder whether or not disinterested means unconditional and unconditional means disinterested. And I thought about the person who witnesses something terrible is going to happen. And in an instant, they rush to help that person without even thinking about any kind of personal injury to themselves. And it happens in a flash. And you mentioned sometimes we get to experience these things in flashes. Yes. You know, yes. I'm wondering if in that moment, that individual is completely disinterested in their own well-being, even if it's just for a few seconds. If that had something to do with the unconditional love and um, disinterest mm -hmm. that was referred to um, yeah. earlier. I hadn't thought about it in that way as somebody rushing in, you know, in forgetting their own safety 
and rushing in to save someone else, a fireman running into a, a fire. Um, the, we had floods here this week and there was actually, it was caught live on television where a, an ER nurse went, who was not on duty, went into um, chest deep water and rescued a person, did a water rescue from an, for an elderly gentleman in a truck who was going to drown without stopping to think about himself at all. And he said, it was just a reaction. I just yeah. did it. Um, and I think, you know, when we, we forget ourselves, which is wonderful, you know, I mean, we have to take care of ourselves, but we also, that is that love for humanity, for the other, whoever that is. So thank you for those thoughts. Thank you. Miss Judy? Yes, uh, hello. Thank you for um, a wonderful presentation on love. Thank and I was thinking again of the passage that you showed from St. Paul. I heard a couple take their marriage vows yesterday, and the minister read part of 1 Corinthians 13 about love is patient, love is kind, and to paraphrase, love is not judgmental. Love is not critical. Love doesn't hold grudges. And yet what it seems to happen in marriage or other relationships is that people who claim they love each other will turn around and start exhibiting these qualities. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we stop these in ourselves? Because it seems that all the help that will come for humanity has got to start from the self. The self is not separate from others. And, mm -hmm. and people who are married have to realize that even though they're two people, I think this couple will work out very well. Of course, you never know in the long run. But I think St. Paul is very great in that. And I realize he was an initiate. After I realized how Gnostic he was, I liked him. At first, I didn't. But uh, I think uh, he has much to say. So, I mean, how the real practice of love seems to be very difficult. And doing it has to start with our in most intimate relationships. Would you agree? Yes, I would. I would. Because it, what a wonderful place to start that practice. But then it expands outward, outwardly. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, I love humanity. It's my neighbor I don't like or... You know, I like uh -huh. my neighbor, it's my spouse I don't like, uh -huh. don't love, you know, whatever that is. So, but to expand it outwardly, but we have to practice it. And, and personal love really is how most of us experience love. But then we move to a more universal type of love. I'm not yes. doing that, but working on. Yes, don't we need to be very hard? Isn't it a voice of the silence say, for our own woes and sorrows, we have to be very hard and strong like a stone, but soft like a mango fruit for the rose of others. Yeah. Because even though we don't want to beat ourselves up, it seems that, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves is uh, is very destructive and it isn't very good love for humanity or ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David? Right. Uh, hey. Hi. Uh, yeah, th thanks for setting such a high bar for us, <laughs> especially drawing from the voice of the silence. I, I was thinking the other, uh, may maybe you did mention it, but the other uh, phrase I always think of HPB uh, sets a high bar when she says, in action, in the deed of mercy is action in a deadly sin. So if we're functioning at the level you're you're uh, giving us a vision of, I guess that's that's where we have to get to. Yeah. But I was also wondering, just a quick question. Uh, I was thinking, you know, HPB mentions uh, always as a very sacrificial uh, agape type person, Father Damien, who uh, went and lived with the lepers mm -hmm. to help them. And he caught leprosy. 
And so I'm wondering, in terms of dharma and karma, how, how would we define his karma, maybe, or, or think about it in terms of that? Or, 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 or do things happen to us through sacrifice that isn't necessarily a karma that we've generated by doing uh, unconscious, you know, things that aren't so good, but, but just, uh, pay, you know, th that's the price for that type of action. Yeah. yeah. So I I should have said this at the very beginning. I, I um, am always willing to take questions, but I never have answers oh. <laughs> um, because I'm seeking. Um, mm -hmm. I do have lots of opinions, however, um, because I am, you know, first and foremost, a theosophist. So those opinions are just right <laughs> up. <with me>. Um, <laughs> but I really, um, I, I, look, I look at myself, I look at others, and, and the story that I kind of skipped because I realized I put in too much material um, was about a man who, you know, badly cut his leg. And um, we can sit and look at him and say, oh, gosh, look, he's bleeding. He had a, I wonder if that's his karma. I wonder what his karma is. I wonder if he was mean to people in his last life. I wonder if he, but that's not what we need. We need to get him medical attention. And then he needs to do rehabilitation. The karmic component of it, from my perspective, is not what happened, but how he handles what happened. So he cut himself badly. The muscles are badly damaged. He may never walk again. How is he going to handle that? Um, and for me, that is... is I think of karma as really, truly as a facilitator of our growth. So am I going to let this wound, this, you know, damage to my leg, am I going to let it um, make me bitter and angry? Or am I going to learn and find some strength in there, sift through those mm -hmm. personal responses that are inevitable, um, and but find that gold in there? Um, be the alchemist for myself mm -hmm. to be able to move forward. So I don't know that that really, I mean, and so those seem to go karma and dharma hand in hand. Mm -hmm. If our dharma is to move toward who we really are. Um, so I don't know, David, if that really oh, answers. Well, actually, I think you touched on it. You, you, to me, what you just said was we have this dharma, our, the karma that comes to us, that's our opportunities for growth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And growing is what we're supposed to do, mm -hmm. I think. From again, just my own opinions, which mm -hmm. are worth exactly what you're paying for. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> Sorry, let me unmute. Uh, uh, lovely, loved it. Uh, I think my most, the thing that really strikes me about your um, piece was about how you talked about karma. And as students of theosophy, we see think we know a lot about karma because we use it so much. We talk about it. But it's remarkable how, how the sifting process is a very subtle and difficult process. Because as students of theosophy, it's doubly hard. And the reason I say that is, even though we know that we don't know the workings of karma, but when we go through, say, suffering, okay, as students of theosophy, we can say, okay, we need to think, okay, this is something I have done either now or before or whatever, and I'm dealing with it. But I also loved what Mabel Collins' words were beautiful about how we use karma uh, actually, we are thinking of creating good karma and we are always subtly maybe doing good because we think we are accruing karma, right? So it's a very difficult thing. And I think to be natural, which you just talked about when you answered David's question, is that you can't spend your time thinking about, is this because of karma? Is this, well, all you can say is this just happened. And how am I going to deal with it? Which you talked about. It's how we deal with it versus sitting and 
uh, cerebrally talking about, oh, karma, so I have to do this. But I also think there's another piece to this. You know, when the good stuff that happens, uh, even as students of theosophy, we don't say, wow, that's karma. I must have done something good. How often do we do that? It's most of the time when we are going through suffering is when we are like, oh, God, we've got to go through this because of something we did. Uh, and I mean, but when it's good stuff that happens, we never say that. So this karma is a very interesting thing. But and we cannot do any sifting till we kind of take it as it comes naturally and not rationalize, which we tend to do a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I noticed that um, you know the voice doesn't say karma is the great sifter and because the great sifter sounds so stern it grinds on it doesn't stop I mean the good thing is that it's reliable but the stern thing but on the other hand well what is the great sifter it's the heart doctrine I was wondering if you could say something about that. I mean, actually, you already have for about an hour, but I was wondering if you could say something more. In a, about, in a, in a nutshell, for me, the heart doctrine is serving humanity. And the only mm -hmm. way to serve humanity is to work on myself by, by learning and growing. So I don't know if that, I don't know if I said it right. I struggled with this, putting all of these concepts together because to me, they're so interrelated. Oh. Um, because we love, well, I think we love humanity because we are willing to serve humanity. We are willing to go through the great sifter. And that is the heart doctrine we grow to help humanity. I think, I think, I don't know. Y'all, again, no answers, lots of opinions. So. Absolutely beautiful, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you for, so much for doing this. Thank you guys just, very much for having just, uh, me. Just thank you for such a wonderful, uh, unconditional agape contribution. <laughs> and, um, very good. I'll see you next time. Everybody be safe. Take care. Oh. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Namaste. Each other. Namaste. Good Namaste.